gentlemen, glad to have your attention up here. Thank you so much for coming here this evening. I'm super excited. Uh, we have Trey Ratcliffe here this evening to speak to us, and he's going to be broadcasting live here via Google Plus uh, to all of his fans that can't be with us tonight. And I just want you guys to know how excited we are to have him here in our store and to present to you guys what he does with HDR photography, how he uses the Mac in his workflow, and to share some of his amazing works from around the world. So without further ado, I give you Trey. Okay. Well, enough clap. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I just shared this on Google+. Plus. There's... Uh, like over a quarter million people that just went out to, and, and they'll be watching along, but even though people are watching here, I'm really gonna be talking to you guys, even though I'm sure you're used to people talking to their computers all the time. I won't, I'll try not to be awkward like that. So we're doing many, many different things today. Many different things. New stuff that maybe if you've been around a while, you've seen some of my old you know, van down by the river talk, but there's new stuff tonight, okay? I'll, I'll start with some, some of the basics, like assuming that you don't know much or you're just kind of photo curious. And then we'll go into some workflow stuff about the middle of the talk. Um, I'll process some photos. Um, I'll share a bunch of photos and we'll do Q and A and everything towards the end, okay? That sound good? Okay, that's what we'll do. Uh, so let me switch over to a little presentation. I apologize if I click around. There's lots of moving parts with this. I'm sort of a one-man show here. So I'm going to share my screen, Keith, okay? So everyone can see what's going on. I'll share my desktop. Okay, so I'll share the presentation, okay? Okay, Keith, you can see my desktop? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, so I apologize for the background noise. I'll, I'll try to project in a Shakespearean way. Sorry if it's too much. Um, that guy's upset about the Apple policy. <laughs> it quieted them down a little bit, though. That's all right. So let me tell you about Stuck in Customs or whatever, me. I'll give you the quick nickel tour in case you don't know. Um, first of all, I'm very, I'm really a very humble uh, guy. Um, uh, I can't believe all this stuff has happened. Um, it's, uh, it's been great. And, you know, I thank all you guys and all the people that come to the blog every day. We've, uh, we've built up this incredible uh, momentum uh, just from word of mouth. We never do any advertising. We don't do any of the traditional stuff. It's all word of mouth, thanks to y'all. Um, every day we get over 150,000 photo views, um, which is crazy, and that's just Smug Mug. And now we've started doing Google Plus and Facebook and all this stuff. It's just accumulating more and more. And I started it because I was fascinated with this style of photography, and I started sharing uh, kind of my techniques and my mistakes and my my successes. and it kind of built up this community because there's a lot of people that like this stuff too. And at first I thought it was just me. So it was a nice discovery to find out that so many other people find this appealing too. And it's so easy. Uh, anybody can do it. You know, you might kind of suck in the beginning, but you get better slowly over time. The fact is that most people really like this stuff. Um, and really most people outside of the photography bubble that we're in, they don't even think about the techniques. They don't think about the post-processing. They just see it and they're like, wow, you know, that's cool. So that's, that's really most people. I find that the only people that really have intense problem with HDR photography are like photographers. Um, and there's a whole host of reasons that we might get into later for that. I kind of really psychoanalyze those people. Um, so if you notice one thing about HDR is that you can have these really rich colors without them being oversaturated. If you look here, none of these colors are really like that intense saturation that you sometimes see in like uh, cheap travel brochure magazines, you know, with the really hot blues, the really hot reds. There's something about the interplay and the tone mapping of these colors that just feels rich and soft and 
sort of impressionistic. Uh, this is another good example of a single raw photo. I like this horse and sort of his Owen Wilson-like hair. Um, this is Hearst Castle in, uh, in, in uh, just north of LA. Um, here's a little tip I'll just throw into the middle of it. Sometimes if you're going to have a saturated color, like this I would say is definitely a saturated color, um, it's good to only have one saturated color. If you have many different, like, you know, reds, yellows, blues, and greens, and they're all saturated, it's too much. So if you're going to saturate a color, just make sure there's just one there. You can have other colors in there, too, but make sure that they're muted and just softer. Otherwise, the eye has nowhere to escape to. They've done these, these retinal tests. You know, they, they track people's retinas as they scan photos. And, of course, this isn't a surprise. The first part isn't a surprise. The second part might that people's retinas um, and, and pupils automatically move to the most saturated thing. But after, I forgot what the number is, it's like 75 or 100 milliseconds, your cones start to burn out a little bit and they need relief. So the eye will just drift away to a less saturated area. They recharge really quickly. But if you have like saturated color by saturated color by saturated color, there's nowhere for the eye to take a break. There's nowhere for the cones to recharge. And the eye will just drift off the photo totally. So oftentimes I try to have saturated colors by non-saturated colors so that their eye doesn't drift off. It just keeps moving around. This is in uh, Patagonia. Uh, this, is, this is here in Austin. Um, this, is, uh, this was the first HDR photo to hang in the Smithsonian. Um, kind of a... I think it was kind of good for the whole sport of HDR because it kind of meant it was accepted as a mainstream type technology. So we'll get a little scientific here if you guys don't mind. This is really cool because sometimes you don't really realize what your brain is doing until you trick it. And this cube alone makes the case for HDR. So if you see this, this yellow square here, that's the exact same color as that brown square up there. I'll prove it in a minute. But it makes you realize how your brain is tricking you and how what you think you know as colors have actually always been sort of a lie. Watch this. Isn't that cool? So colors really only make sense relative to other colors and relative to the light levels that they're in. Watch, I'll go back and forth. Isn't that wild? I love it. And so it makes you wonder when you take pictures of things like what is blue, what is red, what is the proper color? I mean, you, you have these, I don't know if you go into photography forums or not, but they're, they just go crazy talking about color and calibration and, and uh, what, is, what is really blue. I mean, people go crazy, but I think this proves that what color is anything, you know? It, it doesn't even, it's all relative to what's nearby it. Um, so half the people in here see a duck, uh, the other half see a rabbit. So what's interesting to me about this is how your, your left brain is trying to figure out what it is. Like, is it a duck? Is it a rabbit? Is it a duck? Is it a rabbit? But your right brain is just kind of enjoying it. You know, it, it's kind of like, this is curious. What could it be? And it's the interplay between your two brains that makes it interesting. So I do this a little bit with my photos where there's something mysterious and there's something known. And as your right brain is just trying to enjoy it, you know, your left brain is trying to figure out what's going on. And if they play nicely together, it could be a nice experience for the viewer. So inside the EM spectrum, we do all kinds of stuff. This is kind of like the previous example. Um, a and B are the exact same shade of gray. I'm going to have a gray bar come covered up to prove it. Isn't that cool? Here's another one. The green that is facing up, the green face facing up, is the exact same color as the green face facing down. And it has to do with the horizon and the ground. You almost have your own set of colors for everything below the horizon, and then another set of colors for everything above the horizon. But many times they're the same color, you just have different names for them.
So this one's really cool. Maybe it takes a minute to get your head around color. But whenever you look at a given scene, your eye adjusts to that environment, okay? In this case, you look at it, you see black, gray, and white. And then something else comes along, you say, oh, that's white. And you kind of trick your brain and say, oh, that really wasn't white before. This is the real white, right? And then something else comes along, you're like, oh, that's my new white. And it makes you wonder what's happening when you look at a photo. You know, what is the, the, the white spot? Where is the gray point? It, I think what happens is when people look at your photo, their whole worldview changes. And whatever your relative light levels are in that photo, that becomes their world for that five or ten seconds that you're looking at it. So you don't always have to worry so much about um, uh, getting the perfect light levels everywhere. They will adjust. The same thing goes for colors. If your blue is a little bit off, their eyes and brains will adjust to your kind of blue. Uh, there's a lot of photographers that go on and on about color calibration, how important it is. Um, but, you know, 99% of the people that look at your photos aren't going to have color calibrated monitors. And maybe their green's a little wonky or, you know, I know I go to my mom's PC and her, my blues always look so purple on her, but she doesn't notice because... You know, she's kind of reset her worldview for that laptop, and that's what our brains do. So don't worry so much about color calibration. Uh, this is a cool one. Um, so there's two people here. I think uh, uh, you might look at this and say, uh, well, this is, a, this is a female, and that's a male. Um, well, actually, it's the exact same face. It's a computer-generated face, but... Uh, this one has 5% more contrast. And it kind of makes you realize that your brain only looks at things relative to other things. If any one of those was there by itself, you may not know whether it's a male or female. And it works the same way with colors and light. By putting things that are relatively interesting by each other, it makes them more interesting. So we only see a little bit of the EM spectrum we see this little visible light range. And just beyond where the eyes stop, your skin begins. Everything that goes into your neural network, into your brain, that comes through your eyes, that's the same neural network that's taking all the input from your skin. So by having some of this thermal IR, some of the heat, and having these warm tones in your photo, you can subconsciously make the viewer feel a little bit warm. Or by taking out those warm colors, you can make them feel sub subconsciously a little bit cool. It's not an active brain thing, but it's, it's there. And that's why these colors have these names, I think. Um, I'll show you a few other recent photos. Um, some of these are unpublished still. Uh, this one is in Paris. Uh, this technique is great for um, churches. Churches are always very, very hard to shoot. Um, this is in Lijiang, China. Uh, it's a be beautiful place. Um, I took this a few weeks ago. Uh, this is the uh, final night of the space shuttle. What it was on um, here on the last time on Earth, really, uh, in this position. I took this on my birthday, my 40th birthday, in fact. Um, this is one I got in China. Uh, so I'll give you a little tip along with this one. I. Uh, you know, I like landscape photography, obviously, so I'm always getting these wide expanses. And if you like landscape photography, too, you're probably, you probably like to use wide angles. But now I always try to take um, a zoom lens with me. Like this is at about 200 millimeter or something. Because if, you, if you're in an interesting situation, you may be able to take that landscape shot and then create like 20 shots out of it. So while I was up here, I probably made, you know, 10 to 15 shots I really like. Um, I think a few years ago I might have just taken one shot, but now I like I like piecing it together. It's sort of a game to see how many interesting compositions you can make. It's, a, it's really like a game in a lot of ways. Uh, this is from Burning Man. Um, I got down really low. Um, here's another tip with HDR photography is that you should you should try to get blacks in your photos because to me, these deep blacks help give other colors their vibration. They give other colors more meaning. And one problem you might notice with other people's HDRs or 
even my early ones, is that everything is lightly colored, right? There's no blacks, there's no shadows. Um, it doesn't quite um, work for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, if you compare it to Impressionist painting, which people always compare HDR photos to, uh, Monet said that no shadow is black. Um, every shadow has a little bit of color. And that works okay with pigments, but in this world of pixels, I think it's okay to have some darks in there because these darks really help to anchor the eye. Um, this one I got in China also. I've been to this drum tower like seven times. I've never gotten a good photo. And this time I feel like I finally got something I was happy with. I, I circled it time and time again. It's a real challenge. Um, in fact, the seven previous times I had been there, I, I just walked away with no photo. And it's frustrating, but now I just, I just don't take the photo if I know I'm not going to like it later because I only have so much time to post-process. Um, this is a textured shot. I do quite a bit of texture stuff too. And I usually do this when it's a really awesome place, but the sky is just boring. Um, I don't like a boring sky. Um, and there is something about this technique that it's very nice. I'm still experimenting with it. Um, this is in um, uh, Nagano, Japan, a snow monkey. Uh, so here's another thing. Uh, so everyone thinks I'm an HDR photographer and everything I do is HDR. I guess that's okay. Um, I don't think of myself like that. Um, I like all kinds of photography. I like black and white. I like people. I like models. I like animals. I like it all. Um, and I, in fact, I do an equal amount of almost everything. Um, but I don't post a lot of stuff like this because people are always like, give me more landscapes. We want to see mountains, Gandalf. Um, this, is, uh, this is in Lijiang, or I'm sorry, the Li River in South China. Um, this one is not HDR. And it gets, it, it's tiresome it isn't the right word, but I get comments all over the place. And every photo I put up, people say, is this HDR? I don't, I guess I should make some sort of, uh, I guess I need to just say in the description whether or not it is. But in some ways, it, it doesn't matter, you know. I, I don't like some of these questions because I, I, I guess I understand the questions, but I kind of wish people didn't care. Or if they liked it, they would just try to recreate it and not really know how it was done. Um... It's not that I don't mind explaining things to people. I just encourage people to guess and try to figure it out on their own. And so, like, the hyper-questioning nature of people, I, I sometimes don't like to encourage that because, you know, I don't want to think that, uh, that the answers are unattainable without asking the question. And I want to make sure that we have time at the end for questions and... You can ask me anything you want. It's all right. Um, here, first, I'm going to show you a few new photos I took just in the last three days. And I use, I use Stuck on Earth to do these, by the way. Um, so here's one. Uh, this is a really cool cemetery. Uh, just south of San Francisco. It's actually across the street from the, the YouTube offices. Um, anyway, I think that one came up pretty nice. Um, this is downtown San Francisco. I've been to San Francisco seven times. I've never gotten the photo I wanted. I, I finally got it this time. Um, this is an HDR, five exposures from minus two to plus two. That's most commonly what I do, minus two to plus two, unless I'm shooting into the sun and then I go minus three to plus three. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's this thing on almost all cameras called auto bracketing. And you can set the exposure limits on both sides of zero. Okay, so like minus two means it's a quick exposure with a quick shutter speed. Plus two means it's a long exposure with a slow shutter speed. And so sometimes when you're shooting into the sun, you need it to be hyper quick. And that's why you would do minus three. But otherwise, I find 95% of the time, minus 2 to plus 2 is, is more than enough. And in most cases, you'll see when you look at my Lightroom, that's, that's what I do. Oops. Um, here's another one. Maybe you guys saw this. I just posted this a few hours ago. 
Um, this is actually taken from the same roof. I zoomed in at like to 300 millimeter, 300 millimeters to get this. Um, if you go back, see this little area right here? That's what it is, okay? And so that's kind of what I mean by, you know, you're just taken in by the whole thing. But if you just get a good zoom lens and like you say, oh, this area could be interesting. And then you zoom in and you get something like that. I mean, there's hundreds of photos from this location. So there's no reason you shouldn't take up powerful lenses. And it's a, it's just a big game and have fun with it. It's, it's fantastic. Um, this is taken from the other side, right? Everyone kind of looks at the Trans America side, but if you just look at the other side of San Francisco, it's, it's very Gotham City-esque and very cool. Uh, this is down by the wharf. Um, I thought this one came out kind of nice. This is the last one. This is down by the docks. I did something a little special here where I, uh, you know, I use a, often a wide angle lens. This is a, a 14 to 24 lens. Um, in this case, I, uh, I aimed it down. When you take a wide angle lens and aim it up or down, weird things happen. Some people don't like how lines get skewed and they're no longer vertical. I think it's cool. I always think it's cool. Um, but something really cool does happen when you take something and move it towards the edge is it stretches it out. So it kind of makes the, you can see my pointer, yeah. It makes the Transamerica building even taller and more pointy in this way. And what I'll do is I'll show you the original photos of some of these so you can see how they started. All right. Okay, so let's look at the Lightroom here. Yeah. And see what we have going on. Well, we have an ebook on workflow um, where I go through in incredible detail. And so it's hard to summarize here, but I'll do my best. But one of the most important lessons about workflow, <clears throat> and one of the reasons I, I hesitate even telling you what my workflow is, is not because it's like a trade secret or anything like that, but a lot like taking photos, I think people should discover their own workflow. Um, everyone has slightly different technology at home. You know, they may have different tools or different kinds of computers. The overall idea is that there's never a workflow that should remain the same for more than three months. I, I change my workflow every three months. I tweak something, I get a different tool, I get a different drive. Um, something changes. So your workflow should be like this living thing, okay? I know everyone wants to have a, a system. Like, oh, if I just had a system, everything, everything would be organized. And, but that's an illusion. There, there is no such thing as a perfect system. It's, it's a living system, and it changes with the environment in which you're in and how you take photos and whatever equipment you happen to have around you. So I think that's, that's the best way to think about it. So I'll show you the system that I've kind of integrated into my life. And I also need to throw in a, a, a bit of a caveat here. I'm on my laptop, and my laptop can't hold my whole library. And this is, this is a problem. Um, so I used to have two computers, a laptop and a big Mac Pro. And I still do, but I actually don't use the Mac Pro anymore because I've gotten so addicted to the SSD on this drive. If you've never got at an SSD on a computer, you don't even know what you're missing. It's amazing how fast this thing is. Maybe you've noticed as I move around how fast, it's just, it's like it's all in RAM. Everything's in RAM all the time. It's, it's amazing. So now I process my photos on here. I use this to hook into my main library. So now this laptop has kind of become the center of my world. I probably still will get a Mac Pro in a few months. I heard they're going to upgrade them, and so I'm kind of waiting on that. Um, but uh, in the meantime, this, this is my system, okay? How do I organize this? So I travel with the laptop, and on this most recent trip, I basically clean off my laptop so I have no photos on it at all, okay? Because I know that on the trip, I'm going to be loading it up with a lot of photos. So I use Lightroom. You might use it, Aperture is fine. I think they're all the same. 
It recognizes my camera. I used a D3S to take these. Let's see what we can find here. Uh, so this one was kind of interesting. Um, this is Thomas Hawk. Okay, this will be a good one because I think this will be a good photo, but I didn't expose it very well. Um, I think I can pull something out of it. Okay, so I'm going to give that five stars. Okay, so that's one I'll work on. Um, but normally I'm a little bit more careful when I go through. I go through one by one. I'm pretty fast, you know. But still, I don't just look at the thumbnails. So I remember taking pictures. This is uh, a girl that was on the photo walk with us. She's one of the photographer's girlfriends. And she's always just kind of walking around modeling it up. So she's just kind of around for photos. And I remember one of these might have been good. Let's see here. So you can see how noisy this is, but I kind of like I kind of like how she is. I kind of like her strut or whatever. I like these pink windows, so I'll start this, and we'll see if we can make this an interesting photo. Okay. I was I had a fixed lens, 50 millimeter, so I couldn't zoom in. I couldn't do a lot, um, but we'll see what we can do with that. Okay. Um, good. Okay, so we'll just say those those two, and. I'll go select the other one. There we go. And I'll move these into unprocessed. Okay. So then if I go into unprocessed, I see that I have these two photos here. Okay? So, um, I, these are not, this is not an HDR situation. This is just a, a street shot. But I'm going to show you how I use Lightroom because I, I do this stuff all the time, especially for family photos and, and this sort of thing. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this one. Um, so there's another mode up here. There's library and there's develop. Okay. Uh, we're going to go into develop mode. And that's going to swap out the panels on both sides. Okay. Um, and I'm going to start messing with this panel to see what we can do to clean this up. Okay. Um, and by the way, I'm not really an expert in Lightroom. I'm pretty good, but I'm not an expert. There's always people that know more than you. And it's kind of the same thing with your camera. Don't feel like you need to know everything in order to be proficient at it. I probably only know uh, 30 or 40 percent of Lightroom. And maybe every week I might add another percentage or so. Uh, so don't let all the controls confuse you. And don't assume that I know what everything is, because I don't. I know what a lot of it is. Um, anyway, that's sort of an important lesson there. Okay. So I'm going to crop this thing right away. Now, if you notice my, I don't use the rule of thirds. I use the golden ratio or phi. I think this is the better system. You can change the way these overlays look. It's one of these. Does anyone know which one it is? Any Lightroom experts in here? View grid? No. No. It's uh, tool. Oh, here we go. Crop guide overlay. So it's crop guide overlay. I have golden ratio on. By default, it's on third or grid. But I think this is the way to go. Okay. So I'm going to crop in tight like this. I want to get the word hardware in there. I want to get Thomas's face. Something like this, okay? Now, it's pretty dark, okay? So, one of the best... This panel here is one of the most valuable, okay? It has exposure, recovery, fill light, blacks, brightness, and contrast, okay? So, we're going to increase the exposure. And this is the best reason in the world to use RAW, okay? Your, your, your camera could probably do JPEG and RAW. Always stay in RAW. Because 
a JPEG will just catch one slice of the light. And you can do some adjustments, but you can't do nearly as much as you can do with RAW. And you'll see this here in a second. I hope. But I've, I've done photos like this, so I think this will work out OK. Um, a RAW photo will capture all the light that's there. It's almost like a thick cube of light that you can adjust as you um, go through this process. So we're going to mess with the exposure here. Okay, We're going to increase the exposure. You'll see how everything gets a little bit brighter. Okay. Now you can see there's also quite a bit of noise. That's OK. Maybe we'll do that later. Don't worry about that. By the way, don't, don't worry so much about noise. Everyone, you know, when you post a photo online, the noise police always come and visit. So you got some noise in the upper left quadrant. Really, the, I know this for sure, is that 98% of the photos that people look at, they never zoom in on. 98% of your digital face to the world, they're going to see in a maybe even at a big size, you know, a thousand pixels across. And you really can't see noise then. But there, there are ways to get rid of the noise. Uh, I'll show you how to do that too. There's many ways. I may show you a few. Okay, so, uh, so as exposure goes up, it also blows out some areas. Like if you look at the hardware area, as this gets brighter, that whole hardware area gets a little bit hot, doesn't it? Okay. I mostly just want to brighten up Thomas. So we'll make the whole thing hot areas and makes them a little bit softer. Okay. Fill light takes the darker areas and makes them brighter. I don't really mess with blacks too much because that does something pretty drastic. Contrast is nice. Contrast is cha Contrast used to mean one thing 10 years ago. And now the algorithm is quite a bit different. Um, so I like to amp this up a little bit to get everything a bit more punch. Um, clarity, uh, sort of adjust the sharpness. Vibrance and saturation are, um, you know, I never increase the saturation because it does make it too electric and strange. Um, sometimes I'll increase the vibrance, but I don't want to here because it's already colorful enough. He's got a nice, interesting color on him. Okay. Um, this is a tone curve, and you can mess around with this to you find something you like. Um, this gets a little bit um, crazy. Um, I will, will mess with this, but it's also a little scary, so I won't go into it right now. Um, here is where we fix the noise. Okay, there's this one panel called detail. All right, this is wild, and this is new with. Um, the raw importer. Uh, I know that Adobe does this. I assume that Aperture can do the same thing. Um, so what we'll do here is um, you can see all the horrible noise here, right? Like especially, like look at that horrible noise there, okay? So we will take the noise reduction and amp it up. You can see how much better the noise is now. I, I, I can see if I can have both on the screen at the same time. Uh, you see that's no noise reduction. That's a noise reduction. Look at that. It's crazy, isn't it? Amazing. You get rid of almost all the noise like that. It's fantastic. Good. It's still a little bit noisy back there, but it's not it's not so bad. Okay. And then sometimes I like to use in these effects. Some people don't like vignettes, but I do. Um, I'll add a little bit of vignette just to bring the attention in on in on uh, Thomas. So that looks better. We kind of rescued that photo. All right, let's do the next one. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, usually the first thing I do is crop. So I'm going to squeeze this in. I was a little bit off kilter when I took this, but I kind of like that. I might keep it off kilter. 
I'll line her up on Phi here. Okay. Oh, by the way, if you want to twist it, you move this little pointer. You see, if you if you move this point, if you move this pointer off to the corner, you see it changes to a, a twisty twist. Okay. All right, and then you just you just press enter. Okay. So here's Charlie. Let's see what we can do. Um, we'll increase the exposure a little bit. Actually, let's do something a little different. Instead of brightening everything, let's just let's just brighten her. Okay. So we'll click on the paintbrush here. Okay. And we'll go drop this on her neck. And then we can adjust the exposure here. And it will just brighten the area that we're on. Okay. You can use right and left bracket to make this bigger. It's a little much. Let me make this a little smaller. A little bit. Let me drop the exposure on this one a little bit. Oh, sorry, that's doing, that's doing all of them. So let me, I'll say close. Let me do, it's not so hot. Good. Now also, we'll do the converse for this guy because he's a little too bright, right? So we'll go drop that down some. Okay. To get him a little bit lower. All right, now we're going to go. She probably has the same problem as Thomas in that she's very. Um, there's a lot of probably a lot of noise here. So let me close this. Um, let me zoom in here. Yeah, you can see there's quite a bit of noise. Okay. So let's get rid of the noise. First, let me adjust the contrast here to see if this does anything. Now, I also like how all these yellow lines point at her. That's nice. Um, so let's fix the noise problem. This. Okay. It's not bad. Let's add some vignetting. You can do a little bit of it with JPEGs, but it's not as effective. Yeah. It's, it has a lot more information to draw from if it's a raw file. All right, good. That's not so bad. Now, I'm going to try something. I don't know if this will work or not, but I'm going to go uh, edit in Photoshop. Okay, so I'm going to open up Sweet Lady Photoshop, and I'm just going to try, I'm going to try a black and white to see if it's any good. Um, and I'll show you a really cool tool for black and white adjustment. Okay. Um, first, I'm going to duplicate this layer. Okay. You go to Layer, Duplicate Layer. And I'm going to do an adjustment on this. I have all these great filters. I love filters. Um, we're going to use um, Silver FX Pro 2. This is a great, great one. And even if you think you might not like um, black and white photography, this will make you love black and white photography. There's no doubt about it. So, so I'll tell you a neat little story about Silver FX Pro. Um, so the greats, right, all the great black and white photographers from yesteryear, they all had their own little techniques and their own little picadillos in the way they did their images. Well, these guys at Nick studied them inside out, and they built all these presets that did the same things as the greats. 
Yeah, that's that's kind of nice. I don't know if it's true, but it's an amazing story, and it, it kind of I kind of get that sense as I go around. Um, but as you click around, you'll see all kinds of different things that will do all kinds of different uh, versions. You know, some will be very bright, some will be moody. You know, it starts to have a little bit of this sort of New York grungy feel to it. They have different borders you can put on. And the lower you get, the funkier it gets. Um, you get all kinds of strange stuff down at the bottom. I usually find one that I kind of like and think is interesting. And then I uh, do further adjustments later. OK, so I'm going to pick one of the less extreme ones up here. Let's see here. I'm going to do something like this. And then I'm going to do the same kind of thing where I take a control point, and I'm going to brighten her up again, OK? Now, this has this really weird German interface. Um, uh, see, how do I explain it? Okay, so like this is like the center point, and then the more you stretch this one, is the radius of what you're affecting. All right, and I can so I can increase the brightness in that area just a little bit, increase the contrast. I want to lower the contrast a little bit, amplify the whites in it. You can make even more details if you like with the structure. You can also do uh, funky things with uh, this selective color. Like, let me show you. It's kind of neat. I don't know. Sometimes it can be weird. Like, let's say that I make it really big. Um, I can adjust the selective color, and it will just, you know, just do her dress or whatever you happen to be on. You might just do the yellow or other yellows. Um, it can be kind of a neat thing. We're not going to do that here, though. Um, I want to brighten her up a little bit more still. Okay. Let's brighten up her legs. Even though I do like how they're contrasty, we're just going to brighten them up a little bit. Just so she's got a bit of a glow around her. Okay, we're going to take this guy over here. This is Jonathan Goody. He was on the photo walk. He's a nice guy, but we're going to darken him here a little bit. In fact, we'll, we'll darken everything in this area. You really have to watch out where you put the point, because wherever you can see that as I move the point around, it does all kinds of wild things. So you got to get into a point that's not too wild. Good. Okay. I'm going to brighten her up a little bit more. I'm going to drop one more point up here. And you know, I mean this is this is what this is what the photographers of yesteryear used to do. They would do this point system and brighten and dark in different areas. Um, there was always manipulation going on. They just didn't call it Photoshop. Okay. Good. Okay, then we'll say okay. And now it will render this. There we go. I think it also added some noise to give a sort of old film look. OK, so that's the after. OK. And let's look at the before. That's the before. That's the after. I'm sorry, hang on. I think I forgot to share my Photoshop window. So let me, let me save this, and it will pop back into Lightroom. There we go. OK, so that's what I just finished working on using uh, Nick um, Silver Effects Pro. Okay. All right, so it went from uh, this. Actually, let's do, it, let's do it right. Okay, so it started like this and ended up like that. Okay? I'm pretty happy with that. 
it's fun. It's fun to experiment. You know, I don't, I do not consider myself at all a good uh, street photographer, but I love, maybe you're like me, you like looking at street photographers and I like swimming in their waters from time to time. Um, but it's um, tools like this um, can make you look a little bit better than maybe you really are. And um, uh, there is, remember, remember, this is a nice lesson maybe, that today as a photographer, you're as much a photographer as you are a magician, okay? And what you do, you do magic. And when I sit here and I show you all the steps in the magic trick, you know, you've seen magic tricks as they're broken down, right? You go, oh, that's how they did it? That's kind of disappointing. But if you can compartmentalize the steps that are taken and at the same time see the entire arc of the magic trick and appreciate the magic as a whole, then both can be quite joyful. And remember, most people that look at the final product don't know everything that went into it. To them, it's just magical. Um, so don't let the breaking it down step by step by step, don't let that take away from it because I think it adds to it if you can appreciate both at the same time. All right. Um, so before we open up to q and I'll show you a few other things here in my Lightroom. Let's go back to the library. Let's go to all photographs. And I'll show you some of the before shots of those photos I had shown you. Okay. So let me scroll up here. Oh, let me show. So while I was on the photo walk, I had two cameras. Okay, I had my my uh, sort of people one with the 50 millimeter, and then I also had my D3X with the 1424 on there. And some of the shots I got um, took were these. This is an alleyway with five exposures. Okay, that that could be interesting after I process it. Um, Here's another one I took, kind of a cool sign, a nice perspective. I think this will come out neat when we're done. Um, I got this cool building, this tattoo building. That's the dark, minus two, minus one, plus one, plus two. That'll come out really cool, I think. I'm excited about processing all of them. I think this one will come out amazing. Sometimes I'm a fan of symmetry and sometimes I'm not, but I think it works here. This will come out crazy, I think. I can't wait to do that one. Um, I got this corner here. This is in Hate ashbury This is a famous old hippie area of uh, San Francisco back in the day. Um, there's a strange kind of macabre little red riding hood um, scene going on here with a somewhat slaughtered wolf. Um, and then I think the first one I took was here up against this wall. I think this wall is pretty cool. This will come out neat. Now notice there's movement between all these frames. This is a common question is, uh, well when there's movement between the frames, what do you do? Well. Sometimes I'll just take multiple shots um, until I find a still that I like. Like, I kind of like this still here, right? I like over here um, how she's in this position. I like these shadows. So I'll process the whole HDR, okay? And then I'll mask in this. Maybe not this exactly. I might go into develop. And I might increase the exposure. Um, Right, I might increase the fill light, um, the contrast, I'll amp up the clarity, these sorts of things. Let me fix the recovery here a little bit. And then I'll fix the noise, and then I'll mix this together into the final photo. The key is to get this to look as HDR-y as possible, so that when you fuse the two together, it's not so extreme. Like I might mask these these guys. I might mask this part at 100 percent, and this part at 50 percent, this part at 25 percent, so that it's a gradual eye movement from extreme HDR to realistic, and you don't want it to feel too carved out. It's a subtle thing and hard to explain, 
but maybe you see sort of the, the shape of it there. All right, right before we go to questions, I'll show you the component photos for those ones I had shown you earlier. Okay, so this is the before of which one? This is the before photo of the one I had posted on Google Plus. Where is it? This one. Okay. So here's the befores. You can see that I even cropped in a little bit more because I kind of like this building here, but it was still a little bit not so great. Okay. So that's the before of that one. Um, here's the before of my of my favorite shot that I did a few days ago. You can see there's movement in the clouds, right? But really, when you mix it together in photo in photomatics, it kind of just smears the clouds, and I think it's cool because it kind of it gives the impression of clouds. I do the same thing with water. I let I let the water be smeared because I think the impression of water is sometimes better than actual water. Um, let me see if I have any other befores here. Uh, this is the before of that of this. Um, Gotham City shot. And here's, uh, I shot this up against a window. And if you've ever shot out a window at night, you know it's a problem because of the glare. But I found this new thing called a lens skirt. And you, you wrap it around the front of your lens and you suction cup it to the window. And it's all black and you don't have to worry about glare. It's a cool thing. All right, well, let me switch back to my main video here for the Hangout, and then you guys can ask me questions. Anything? Okay. Okay, hello, Hangout, everybody. Sorry about that. Okay, questions. And I'll, I'll repeat the question for the Hangout, too. Yes, sir. Ah, he asked, how do I process a single raw? Um... <coughs> It's really easy. Well, I'll just describe what I'm doing. So I'm going to go pick one of these raw files. Like, let's say, um, let's say this one, OK? I'll pick it up, and I just drop it right into Photomatics. Um, I usually do crank up, reduce noise as much as I can. I leave everything else alone, and I say OK. And then it up just like normal, okay? And you can do all kinds of adjustments. You can see it already looks better, right? It already looks amazing. Um, it just shows what you can do with a single RAW in HDR. And then you can start messing with this. Um, you know, the, the sliders change uh, based on the situation. It's never the same situation. Um, but yeah, you can get a tremendous result by just dragging that RAW file in. The other thing that people do sometimes, here, I'll, here we go, hang out. Let me share this screen with you, okay? Share screen. Here's, here's my photomatic screen. So you guys can see I did that just by drawing, dragging a raw file in. And it already looks really sharp, I think. So the other way to do it um, is to take that raw file into Photoshop or Lightroom and make three different JPEGs out of it. But I'm not convinced that's the best way to go. The only time that would be a good way to go, I think, is if you just you didn't capture all the light that was there. Right? Let's say that it was like a a, a sunset, okay? And you're shooting into the sun and all you have is one raw file to, to show for it. You may want to go in and see if you could do a minus three and a plus three. Um, it's worth an experiment. Um, but you can see the results of just dragging in a raw. It's really good. Another, yes, sir? Um, yes. Yes, I can. Let me, uh, how should I, well, let me press play on this little, uh, and turn down the sound. 
No, I can't do that. That's too complex. Uh, no, I can't do that either. Well, basically, I do it with this new app called Stuck on Earth. Okay, it comes out in two weeks. It's it's great for planning trips. There's a new video that just came up today on the internet. Scoble did it. Um, I go through it. You'll see what I mean. You'll see why it's the best tool. You'll love it. Okay. I hate to, I hate to point to my own app as the best way to, to plan a trip, but it is. I mean, I've accidentally become an expert in finding awesome places and traveling and just being efficient about finding awesome stuff. And there was no app that did it. All these other travel apps from these big travel companies are just lacking in one way or another. You can tell they're all designed by committee. Or they're trying too hard to figure out how to charge people to make money with upsells. Or maybe they only work online. Or maybe the UI is horrible. Or maybe it's just Yosemite and you have to get a different one for Paris and a different one for Rome. It's just a mess out there. So just use mine. <laughs> okay. yeah. Oh, by the way, here's, here's something else about this. Is it's, it's a great community. And if any of you guys want to be editors or curators, let me know because we have these top 50 lists, uh, like best places in Austin, you know, secret spots. Um, you don't, they don't have to be your photos. You can go curate some other photos that are in Flickr. Um, our head editor is this guy named Topher Martini, and uh, he can hook any of you up. Just let me know. I'll, uh, I'll get you in. You could be an editor, and you could be there at, at launch, and everyone will see your top 50 list, and people will follow you or whatever. Yes, ma'am. Can you walk me through what is your essential kit that you take when you travel? Yes, my essential kit. Your gear. My gear. Um, I, so I'll tell you now, but also if you go to my YouTube channel, slash Duck and Customs, I have a video like three, maybe five or six videos ago of what I took to China. I just took my bag and I threw it on the bed and I just started emptying it out. Um, it's embarrassing because I'm not that organized. I'm fairly organized. I'm just not that organized. But anyway, here's what I take. Um, I take two cameras, just in case one breaks. Uh, I, my cameras are a little over the top. You don't have to take cameras this nice. Of course, it doesn't really matter what kind of camera you have. Having said that, I, I carry a, a D3X and a D3S. My D3X is 24 megapixel Nikon one, and that's what I use to make my sort of epic kind of shots, I guess. And then and that's always on a tripod, okay? I have a really right stuff tripod and a head. Um, I have all my gear on my site too. Um, and I usually carry that around on the tripod, you know, like Gandalf's staff, okay? And then, like, slung across my chest in sort of this Chewbacca bandolier, I have my D3S that has uh, a 50 millimeter prime or an 85 millimeter prime. And I use those for people shots or objects or little things. Um, in my bag, um, I have a few lenses, not that many really. Um, I have and this is for my D3X, this is for my landscape thing, okay? I have basically two lenses that I use 98% of the time. My 14 to 24. And my 28 to 300, okay? Now, they're both expensive lenses, and they don't need to be that expensive. Like Sigma makes a really nice wide angle lens. That's a 10 to 20. It's like half price. It's very good. I use that for a long time. Um, because I, you know, I don't want you to think that I'm only recommending expensive stuff because you could do this quite inexpensively. Um, and then there's a caveat with the 28 to 300 lens. And that is, um, it's very slow. And that means it's doesn't have a good f-stop but since I'm always on a, a tripod I don't care about that um, I, the aperture doesn't really matter when you're on a tripod because most of the time in landscape photography you're just trying to get everything in focus 
Um, the only other lens I carried with me on this last trip was a 24 prime, but I didn't even use it that much, really, frankly. I probably shouldn't have taken it. Um, so I just take four lenses, 14 to 24, 28 to 300, 50 prime, and 85 prime. Um, besides that, I take a four backup drives. Um, I like I try to every week I try to mail one home so that there's you know some redundancy out there in the world. Um, I carry wires and nonsense and um, that's basically it. I don't think I forgot any. Yes. How do I white balance? I always, well, 99% of the time I use auto white balance and it's fine. It's fine. I bring it into Photoshop and Lightroom and if the light's way off, I'll adjust the color so it looks right again. Um, you know, no matter what white balance you shoot in, you can always change it when you're back in Lightroom if you're off, if you're in some weird tungsten situation. Uh, but I think auto white balance is a really good job. Yes, before photomatics. Yes, that's right. Yes, sir. I have to use uh, Photoshop HDR Pro. Yeah. yeah. It's free graphic Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah, I know what that is. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that I would just stop messing with Photoshop's HDR for now because. I think it's an interesting thing. Yeah, you can do okay with it, but I, I think Photomatics is only it's less than a hundred dollars, and then I think my my discount code is like fifteen off or something. So it's not that bad, and it will save you so much frustration. But what it when it says it's going to flatten your image, what it means is you're going to lose all of your layers, and it just goes down to one layer. Um, and I don't know why they do it like that. I'm not using it. Ah, uh, well, then you could ignore that. It, it probably just says that as a matter of course, and it doesn't really even matter. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a comparison on my site between Photomatics and Photoshop. I, I wish Photoshop did it all because I don't like using multiple tools. I, I feel like it's just too many tools. I like to do it all at once, but um, and I've used many different software packages, but Photomatics is so fast; it's just wonderful. Yeah. Yes, sir. How do you compare that? So he asked, how do I compare Photomatics to Nick? Um, well, I've used both. Um, I think Nick is coming out with a 2.0. Uh, it might be out. I don't know. Uh, and 1.0 was all right. Um, I, think it, I think it can appeal to people that don't want to do any Photoshop at all. The thing is, is that all these HDR algorithms will mess up part of a photo, okay? My goal in Photomatics, or Nick, or any of them, is to get 70% of the photo looking interesting, and then clean up the rest. Now, I, my workflow is I like cleaning up the rest in Photoshop, both because I'm very conversant with Photoshop, and it's, it's infinitely flexible. So Nick's approach is that you don't have to go into Photoshop, you can drop these control points in there, like I did with Silver Effects Pro, and fix those areas. Um, it's not so bad, but I don't have the granular control that I actually have with, with Photoshop, if that makes sense. Do you accept my answer? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, we do do photo walks in Austin. Uh, in fact, we had a record world record one here with like 212 people. Um, they're always big. They're lots of fun. Um, we'll do another one for sure. I, I don't have a plan, but we'll, we'll do it. Yeah. 
<laughs> I would like to do San Antonio too. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, it's not that it's only an hour away, right? I have no excuse. I should do San Antonio too. Yeah. Any other burning questions? It could be anything. Yeah. You just got back from Burning Man. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about your experience? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Burning Man is great. Um, he asked for me to talk about my experience with Burning Man. Um, so Burning Man is really weird. I don't, I don't uh, fit into any group. You know, there's like, there's like the the hippies and like the druggies and the ravers. I'm not really any of those. Um, yeah, they're great for pictures. It's, it's exhibition of seven. So if you're scared of taking pictures of people, everyone likes to have their photo taken there. 99%, right? Um, I think I took three or 4,000 photos and only, I'm not, what I do is I like to, I like to take pictures of people when they're not, when they don't notice, right? And so that they're natural. Because when they know, even if they're a good actor, they have to be an amazing actor to pretend not to know, right? So I like to get them natural, and then I go up and show them afterwards, and we have a nice little interchange. Um, and out of the 3,000 pictures I took, only two people asked me to delete them. And that's because they were school teachers, and they didn't want... So I was like, fine, I'll delete it, you know. Uh, but really, it's, it's a target-rich environment. And um, artistically, it's fantastic, because um, I imagine most people in here, you're at least kind of in touch with your artistic side or whatever. Um, you know, so I think generally as artists, we're very non-judgmental about people, right? And anything, anything goes as long as you're not really bothering many other people. That's fine. But we live in this world where not everyone is like us, right? So our, our, our guard is always up because you, you never know when you interact with someone how judgmental they might be or how relaxed or how vulnerable you can be. But something weird happens at, at Burning Man. After you're there for about a day or two, you realize that you're in this world where there's just no judgment going on at all. And you can really let down your guard and be fully relaxed and kind of explore this artistic side that you sometimes hold back in regular society. So it's great from a photography perspective. It's great because you see stuff there that you've never seen before in your life. Um, I need constant visual stimulation, and I get stuff there. I've seen all kinds of things in the world, and that's the only place in the world I can go that I don't know what I'm going to see, but I know it's going to be awesome. Everywhere else I go, like, you know, I know that if I – I've always wanted to go to the north of Libya because they've got the best Roman ruins. I know I'll go there and I'll see great Roman ruins, but Burning Man, you just don't know, but it's always awesome. Yeah. So you generally, when you're taking pictures of photos, you'll always try to get the candid shot and approach them later for permission? Um, yeah, always. Yeah, that's what I do. And uh, that's what a lot of other photographers do. Um, uh, you know, there's multiple schools of thought. Some people say you should always ask for permission. But I think that just really breaks the spirit of it. And... Um, and really, you know, if they want to delete it, of course I'll delete it. But most people really like having their picture taken. They like thinking that they're interesting enough for you to pluck out of a crowd. And, you know, um, if you have a good lens or whatever, even if you're just kind of starting out, you probably get a pretty decent picture of them, better than the party pictures their friends are taking of them. And so they'll see that they'll be like, oh, this is really nice. They'll be shocked, especially if you do some depth of field work, you know. This, the, the depth of field thing is a mystery to not photographers. Like, why is the background all fuzzy? I don't understand. How did you do that? I look amazing. And you know, and then you exchange emails and you mail it to them later. Um, yeah, so it's it's 98% of the time, maybe even 99, it's a very positive experience. And you know, I get a good photo, they're happy, we have a nice little talk. It's a little talking point. So yeah, it's great. You can always be an awkward. It can be an awkward moment. Uh, people can sense if you're a creep, you know, because uh, there there are there are creepy photographers there. Sure. Uh, and I don't I don't like them. So sometimes I see them doing creepy things, and I, I give them the evil eye because um, they give all of us a bad name. I think most of us are just happy-go-lucky people that. 
like interesting things, like interesting faces. And we just like to take pictures for the love of it. We're not being skeevy or anything. I don't I don't take pictures of all the nickels that are there. I, I'll, I'll take a picture of a naked girl if she's doing, if it's part of the scene, you know, like if she's, like, has some flowing silk thing and is doing yoga in the middle of the desert and she just happens to be naked, then I'll do it. But there are a few lascivious people there. I, I'm not one of them. Uh, people people can sense what, what kind of person you are. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so he asked, uh, what about uh, photography rights at Burning Man? Can you uh, take photos? Can you uh, use them? What's the deal? Because the disclaimer is really scary. Um, it's fine. Everyone is there taking photos all over the place. Um, I had a media badge on my camera. I had to go over and get my cameras tagged. I've done that the last two years. Um, but it doesn't even matter. Nobody asked the whole time to see my media pass. And I was, there were probably, for every thousand people there that were taking photos, only maybe 50 had media tags. <laughs> Everyone is taking photos all over the place, especially with their phones. I mean, there's there's teenagers out there with their uh, iPhones. Um, everyone is taking pictures all over the place, and everyone is posting it to their Facebook. It's just, you know, they don't read that disclaimer. Uh, they just share it. Now, Burning Man doesn't have a problem with it, as long as it's a, a personal share, right? The only time they have a problem with it is uh, if you are trying to sell it to make money, because um, it's kind of their brand or whatever. Also, they, I, I haven't, I didn't read this specifically, but, you know, I, I think I took 150 images I was happy with, and I sent it to their media team, say, is it okay if I publish these? Because I just, you know, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but they've always approved all my images. But I don't take pictures of people in compromising positions, because there's there are famous people that go there, there's actors, there's all kinds of you know, and maybe they're doing weird stuff or whatever, because it's sort of an alternate reality. Um, so I don't take pictures that could be, like, awkward. You know, I, I more stick to artistic stuff. So they're, they're probably pretty scared about that as well, because it could, you know, it could be bad. And it hasn't really happened yet, but I can see it happening. They're also very anti-video. Um, but I didn't really take much video there, and I haven't published any video yet. My video was so innocuous, I don't think they would care. 